Nexus PMG welcomes you to the Bigger Than Us podcast, which we as energy geeks lovingly refer to as the BTU. Bigger Than Us is a podcast that focuses on ideas that will shape the future of our planet and ultimately our existence. We will occasionally lean into energy topics because after all, it's the key to our collective survival, but we'll also explore other ideas and topics that we believe will have an impact that is bigger than us. And now, on to today's show. Hello and welcome to the Bigger Than Us podcast. I'm your host, Raj Daniels, and today I'd like to welcome Rob Moyer to the show. Dr. Rob Moyer is a nationally recognized and award-winning environmentalist and president and executive director of nonprofit Ocean River Institute. He continues his several decades of tireless efforts to make the planet bluer and greener. Rob and Ocean River Institute has assisted environmental groups on a local, national, and global scale, including Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary, the Coastal Bird Program of Cape Cod, Sunshine Wildlife in Florida, the Campaign for Environmental Literacy, the British Virgin Islands Environmental Council, and Sea Change, Friends of the Wester Ross Marine Protected Area in Scotland. Rob, how are you doing today? Thank you, Raj. I'm doing very well. Rob, I'd like to start the show by asking about Doodlebug. Can you share with the audience what Doodlebug is? <laughs> yes. Doodlebug was this old robo that was at our house, and we would take it down to the beach, and my dad we had a little sail that went into Doodlebug and a little, you know, tan bark red sail. And dad would hold the boat um, standing in the water. And I'd sit in the back of the boat uh, and hold the sail with one hand and the steering stick with the other. And this is how I learned how to sail a boat. And he said, always go to windward uh, so you can always come home again. So Doodlebug was the first sailing boat. <laughs> now, you mentioned sailing windward. For, for those of us who are, you know, land bound, can you explain what that is? Right. So the most amazing thing for me about sailing is that you take the energy of the wind and by using sails in a vessel, you manage to go into the wind. You take its energy and you go against it. So that um, place you want to go, like a buoy, if you're racing, you're going to turn the boat around a buoy, that if it's upwind, that's called windward. And so to go windward is very difficult in a sailboat. And sometimes you can do it by zigzagging back and forth, but sometimes you just can't because um, the wind is too strong or the tide is against you and it's too narrow to tack back and forth. So it's for me, it's a, a life learning of how to tackle things that you take one approach and it, as far as you can, then you shift directions and try again a different approach. And uh, it's no one's fault that it takes many times. You just got to keep doing it. And sometimes you don't succeed. And how have you translated that experience into your experience with Ocean River Institute? Right. So the Ocean River Institute was created to help people make a difference for cleaning up the environment, especially clean water and wildlife. And so we're looking for opportunities where there are bills or there are efforts to make a difference. And we bring people together and we try to push in that direction and over, you know, we have our setbacks, but overall, we've been moving to windward to clean up the environment. And how do you do that? That's a good question. So one way is I'm in communication with decision makers. Uh, and uh, for example, in Washington now, they want to do an ocean-based climate solutions bill. And so I learned the details of the bill. And then I explain that to people. We set up a, a, like a petition. Uh, where we ask people to comment on the bill. And, and this is important, is that you know 90% will just sign it, and that doesn't mean much. But when people take a time to understand the issue and ask the uh, decision maker to do something that he's thinking of doing anyways uh, and giving him more reasons for it, uh, that personal relationship helps us to uh, get bills passed. So what kind of questions do you like to see asked by people that are interested in the bill? You don't ask your, your decision maker, do you believe in climate change? You would say, I am upset with climate change because the crocuses are coming up early. 
can you do something about that? And that way, the politician will ind- indicate they understand the problem. So that that's one example. Whether or not they, they move is another thing. But so for uh, we also have a plastic pollution bill. And so there people will explain about how plastic is upsetting them when they go swimming or how they see it clogging up the beaches. And so these specific stories, also suggestions of why, you know, it's important to have a, a nickel uh, charge for single use plastic bags that are made from virgin plastic. So there, people talk about that. Another question that we've had a lot of good feedback on is, what would it be like if the bag was passed? So if there was less plastic pollution, Uh, and it's not just a tax, it's also we are asking uh, producers to be responsible for recovering the plastic and making it reusable and so forth. So it's a complicated bill. But the important thing is to show the decision makers how life would be better if they acted this way. And, And that really helps them do the heavy lifting of crafting legislation, which is not an easy thing. Now, with all of your experience with Ocean River Institute, how do you feel about the probability of these bills passing? Well, the the less comprehensive the bill is, the more precise, uh, the more likely it can pass. So we've been making great strides to have people not put down a fertilizer in the summertime because we say, just don't do it in the summertime. Uh, because that's when the harmful algal blooms are happening off of this. And then we did this in Florida, and there the, the fertilizer is made up of nitrogen and phosphorus. And uh, rather than just say, just use nitrogen and don't use phosphorus because you don't need the phosphorus, in Florida there's so much phosphorus in the ground that they're mining it to put into the fertilizer. So rather than have a list of items to do, which is kind of the making the perfect the enemy of the good, I guess, um, we just said three things. Don't spread in the summertime. Uh, use some slow-release nitrogen uh, fertilizer and uh, respect the setbacks from the waterways. And so the decision maker, the county commissioner, came back and said, okay, we respect the, set, the setbacks. We'll use at least 50% slow-release, and we won't fertilize from June set 1st to September 30th. So that's four months. I wouldn't have known to ask for that. But I'm thrilled because the lawn owner realizes that, well, gee, I'm supposed to use 50% slow release, but maybe I should try 100% slow release. It costs a little more, but it might save me money in the long run. Or, um, you know, if I'm not supposed to fertilize in this time period, maybe I should wait and treat my lawn the way the uh, golf courses do, which is they only feed the grass when it's hungry. And they make sure that none of the, the feed, the fertilizer, goes anywhere but to the grass. So you break it down into into small parts like that. Now, why did you specifically target that algae bloom in Florida? What did you find there? Uh, Well, I I started in Massachusetts, and my son and I were uh, sailing in a small boat, and we got halfway to Nantucket, and the wind died. And so I had a paddle. And when you put your hand in the water five miles out, when you put the water up to my elbow, I couldn't see my fingertips for all the blooming algae in there, the green, brown algae stuff. So I, I made it my mission to try to be able to see my fingertips when they're up to my elbow in the water. And uh, so one of the sources is fertilizer. The other is septic and sewage. And the third is agriculture. So um, they're working on the other two. So I made it my business to look at the fertilizer. And in Massachusetts, you have to go town by town. But in Florida, they have counties. And so Indian River Lagoon is this shallow lagoon that's 156 miles wide and uh, long. And uh, it's only got six uh, counties around it. And there, the dolphins were dying from skin eating fungal infections. There's been a lot of manatee deaths. Uh, it's just a, a really uh, polluted with a harmful algal bloom. It looks like guacamole sometimes. So that why we went to Florida was we could do it county by county. It's a good question. And the reason I asked that was because last night I was doing some research for this conversation and my youngest daughter was looking over my shoulder and I was watching the video where you were speaking about the dolphins that were being killed by the bloom. Yeah, it's really sad. Uh, So the dolphins are dying from um, the skin eating fungal infection and, and also by other diseases. So it's, it's not like the bloom itself is killing them, but it's making conditions that are aggravating and worsening the situation. And it's something that's so easy to in terms of, of putting fertilizer down. Uh, elsewhere, um, dogs have gone into harmful algal blooms and died from um, exposure to it and stuff. Uh, so it is a, a serious problem. So 
if I'm understanding this correctly, and please do correct me if I'm wrong, this is all due to mostly individuals putting fertilizer on their grass? No. In Florida, it's mostly due to um, all the nutrients that have settled in like black mayonnaise in the bottom of, of um, Okeechobee Lake in the middle of Florida. And when there's a lot of water in there, they release this black sludge into Indian River, River Lagoon and also into the Gulf of Mexico on the other side. And so that is 90% of what's feeding the harmful algal blooms. But there's no need to be putting fertilizer on it. So why put straws on the camel's back when it's about to be broken ways? Well put. And in Boston Harbor, it's the other way around. In Boston Harbor, we had a uh, menhaden, a small fish, being chased by thousands of menhaden were chased by the striped bass up into the Mystic River. And right below the Amelia Earhart Dam, they swam into an ocean dead zone and they all rolled up dead on the Saga shore there. And um, there, the septic and sewage is being treated by the Mass Water Resources Authority. And the agriculture is being managed, but what little there is, is being managed by the conservation commissioners to put up hay bales and keep it from seeping into the water. So here in the Mystic River watershed in Boston, what you're putting on your lawn is playing a bigger role than it is on Cape Cod or some other places. Very interesting. So let's go back to Ocean River Institute for a minute. Can you tell us how the organization started? Yes. Uh, I was contracted by um, a bunch of organizations to gather people uh, in that residents of Massachusetts to support an ocean planning bill. And so they, these three organizations, Conservation Law Foundation, Mass Audubon, and the Ocean Conservancy, they worked with the politicians who were writing the law, and I was to get everyone to support the bill. So um, that's when we started, uh, you know, with a uh, petition, you know, sign the petition and... Um, and, and start commenting. So I was the first one to get people to write about it. Uh, and I also set up, um, we had evening gatherings with different community groups to talk about the bill and also support their work. And eventually uh, I rented State House. That was really the clinch. What they said, yeah, rent the State House and bill us for it. And I said, okay, I'll be my own nonprofit and we can do that. Um, and so uh, we rented the house and they said, oh yeah, bring in uh, all these environmental groups to tell the politicians about why there should be ocean planning. Now, if you're the Marine Biological Laboratory, for example, are you going to want to leave the ocean to go talk to a politician on Capitol Hill, I don't, on the Beacon Hill? I don't think so. So I ended up, had a budget so I could, um, uh, I, had, I had legal seafood serve raw oysters and clam chowder. And then I went to the organizations and said, you have people who know your organization working in Boston. Could they come over and man your table? And that way we got 47 uh, tables uh, to do that. And then Leon Panetta came and talked about how his uh, grandfather was uh, in the um, Cannery Row fisheries when it, the sardine fishery crashed. And so he talked about the importance of ocean planning. And, and so we had these student volunteers from a high school running around outside getting petitions. And they actually saw Cameron Diaz, the movie actress, running down the street. And so they ran her down and got her to sign it and stuff. So <laughs> we made the whole process a, a fun one to be. So can you um, share what this organizing principle of, I'm going to pronounce it, subsidiary is? Yeah, subsidiarity is uh, an old term that developed with the same time as federalism. And basically, federalism was top-down management or governance. And subsidiarity was to respect the smallest unit and then help them as they need it. So the Roman legion had a, the highest trained group of the Roman legion was called the subsidi subsidium. And they were ready. So when there was a break in the front line, they would step in and close the break and bring the expertise to battle off that particular tough part. And then they would step away and leave uh, leave the front line back in business. And so um, subsidiarity, environmental subsidiarity means like we've got all these clams out there and then the town will have a clam warden, but the town doesn't have the ability to test the clams for cleanliness. And so the state is the next level up and they test the uh, clams and decide whether they're edible. And if they're not, they close down th that stuff. So environmental subsidiarity is and I saw this happening where in Alaska, where these big ocean groups would go up there to save the beluga whale, and they'd organize the locals. And as soon as they got their law passed, they would just leave. And it's better to organize the locals, as I did starting Salem Sound Coast Watch, 
you know, to manage their area and know how it operates. And so that was another reason for starting the Ocean River Institute was that these small organizations are living hand to mouth and suddenly they have a budget snafu or the equipment breaks. And uh, so we can step in and help them through that period and then step away because they have the capacity to continue on without us taking, you know, we're not into empire building. And oddly enough, the first group that needed that help was the big mass Audubon because they had a beach, a, sea, a shorebird program. And the shorebird person became the shorebird person for the state of California. And she left in January and they decided they'd bring in their new employee in June to write the grant reports. But meanwhile, the birds had to be managed for the breeding season. So the Ocean River Institute got to step in and help coordinate the volunteers and, and keep that program. Now, not directly, but it reminds me of the um, Japanese manufacturing principle. Essentially, in Japanese manufacturing, if you're familiar with it, the person closest to the line has the authority to stop the line at any time if he or she sees there need to be changes made. And in business, there's often a saying about... Um, you know, talk to the person closest to the problem. So it sounds very similar to that. It totally is that because they know what's going on. Exactly. And, and they are there, they're bought in that they, you know, so they're the people on the ground. And we had this problem with environmental management where the scientists would come in and say, you know, this happens for this reason. So you must do this. And then they leave and the manager keeps doing the same thing over and over and the system changes and evolves. And so the animals start going rare or something. And so they come back and they shoot the manager instead of looking at the system and being able to adapt to it. So it's better to be asking the manager, what do you see today and how do we, it's called adaptive management, you know, like you were talking about the front line there. And I see that you've coined a term, ocean stewardship places. Yes, um, is trying to um, look at areas that uh, communities are taking care of and give them recognition for them. I like that idea. Again, putting people close to the problem. Well, yeah, and the answer is solution. You get all these politicians who are saying, what's the number one problem? And then they say, I have fixed the number one problem, elect me. And it's like, no, <laughs> it's like saying, you've got five kids. What's your favorite kid? No, you got to take care of all of them, you know, and you've got to just do stewardship, you know, just don't pollute when it comes to the environment. It isn't a question of what's the worst pollutant. It's like, don't pollute, guys. Speaking of stewardship, recently you launched a Natural Lawns for Healthy Soils competition. Can you share what that is? Yes. So we have this problem of if they would not fertilize the lawns. It, so at first, when I was looking at the harmful algal blooms, it was like, okay, just don't fertilize in the summertime because that's when the water's the warmest and, and, the, bloom, and the algae's the bloomingest. And then in Falmouth, Massachusetts, which is on the coast, south coast of Cape Cod, there was this little pond and they found 16 striped bass dead on the shore that had chased fish in there. And they blamed the lawns stretching down to the waterfront. And so they passed an ordinance saying, don't fertilize your lawns, except use some 100% slow release in the spring or fall. And, um, and that was a real eye opener. But A, they were upset because striped bass are a good game fish and we hate to see them die. But the lobstermen, there was so much blooming algae in uh, Vineyard Sound that they had to carry a, a trap in the back, uh, boiling vat of water in the back of the boat. They would dunk their lobster pots into that to rid the weed of it, to make it not so heavy as the lines would break when they were trapping lobsters. So they were all geared up for this. And then the industry came in and said, the fertilizer industry said, oh no, towns don't know the science of lawn care the way the state does. And so although we wrote to the attorney general office, she had to rule that, yeah, the state has some better science than a town does. And so they struck down the law and they said, if you don't fertilize frequently, your lawn will die. Uh, well, fortunately, Falmouth State Rep, uh, state Senator was Therese Murray, who was the president of the Senate. And so she put the Falmouth bylaw into the uh, state budget bill and passed it. So Falmouth, for the last seven or eight years, has not been fertilizing their lawns and they're just as green as everyone else. But we can't get any other town to follow suit because, because of this ruling. The towns don't know this stuff. The town of Harvard, Massachusetts, increased the setback from the waterways and where you could spread fertilizer from some, I think it was 25 feet to 100 feet. And they took it through town meeting and they're all set to go. 
And then the state came in and said, no, you can't pass that rule because you don't know lawn care the way we do. So instead, we're trying to do a, we have to do a voluntary program. And the other aspect is that um, it turns out when you do put the fertilizer on top, the grass greens up quick because the roots are sprawled on the surface and are very thirsty and they're holding the other plants away from each other. So there's these sun spill spots in between that can bake and dry and it's only permeable by weeds. Uh, and the flimsy plants are easy to be chewed on. So the industry says, oh, let us overseed, which means they'll put more seed in and they'll put herbicides and stuff. So if you don't put the fertilizer on and instead the, the grass roots go down into the soil and develop symbiotic relationships with the fungi and the bacteria so that the bacteria fixes the nitrogen and sends it along its way through the mycorrhizal roots to feed the grass. I mean, grass has been growing great for millenniums, you know, <laughs> and, and you know, like the prairies and stuff and salt marshes. So a lawn that's not fertilized can build an inch of soil in a year by pushing out of the root tips liquid carbon in the form of carbohydrates. And to do that, to put out a ton of carbohydrates through photosynthesis, the green plants are taking, or the grass plants are pulling four tons of carbon dioxide out of the air. So if we could just turn our lawns into natural lawns, we would dramatically increase the drawdown of CO2 out of the atmosphere and also build more soil, which then holds more water. So four inches of soil, of healthy soil, will hold seven inches of rainwater. And so this is protecting our homes from extreme weather events. So there's a whole kind of roundabout um, system of, but people are, are told that lawns are bad. They blame the grass for polluting and for needing lots of water when it's actually the fertilizer we spread that causes the thirstiness and is the pollution. So it's not the lawn's fault, uh, but it's a huge sea change for people's way of thinking because a lot of environmental groups say, pull up your lawns and, you know, put in a parking lot. No, pull up your lawns and, and put in, you know, plants and, and gardens and stuff. However, you know, lawns take the trampling on, and when you step on grass, it signals through the mycorrhizal root system that it needs more nutrients and other elements and stuff. And so it's, it increases photosynthesis when it's been disturbed or when it's fighting something off. So by walking on the grass, you're helping to clean up the air. So is this competition a team effort, and is there a winning besides the obvious benefits to the environment? Yeah. So I, I want to introduce you to... Um, are uh, my uh, summer interns. And Susanna Buckley is um, from uh, Wellesley, Massachusetts. And I was really thrilled why Susanna uh, came on board. And I think I stole your thunder, Susanna, about the, some of the fertilizer. But maybe you can add about some of the problems with fertilizer, too. Okay, Rob, thank you for that. I'd like to introduce Susanna Buckley to the show. Susanna, can you give the audience an overview of your role with the organization and the lawn care competition? Yeah, so hi, I'm Susanna Buckley. I am an intern with Rob this summer at the Ocean River Institute, and I'm focusing on the Natural Lawn Care for Healthy Soils competition this summer and getting people to sign the pledge to stop fertilizing their lawns. And I was asking Rob, is there a winning, is there a team effort? How does this work? Yeah, so there will be a winner eventually at the end. Um, we're pitting towns against towns, watersheds against watersheds, and then organizations against organizations. And so, for example, any organization or group with an environmental tie could create a team and compete. But we're also calculating the percentage of participants per town. So technically, there could be a winner for every town, every watershed, and then an, env an environmental group that gets the most pledges as well. And when is the competition over? We don't have an exact date for when it will be over. We're expecting it to continue in the fall. The main goal is to more so get as many people to pledge as we can rather than determine a winner as soon as possible. It makes sense. And I appreciate you sharing that. Welcome back, Rob. I appreciate Susanna sharing that. Uh, what I'd like to do is introduce um, Deba. Deba, welcome to the show. Can you share your role in the organization and the competition? Yeah, um, my name is Adiba Sheikha from Lincoln, Massachusetts, and I am playing um, kind of leading uh, different towns and uh, different watersheds. Susanna, Jacqueline, and I all have different watersheds. And town-wise, I am from Lincoln. So there is a Lincoln-Sudbury team competing with other towns that are 
nearby, like Concord and Carlisle joint as a team and Acton and Boxborough joint as a team. And we all have about 8,000 households uh, with each of the combined towns. So it works out very nicely um, in terms of calculating who's ahead and yeah, just kind of getting different groups involved and, you know, coordinating with the different towns um, to get, you know, more momentum for the competition. Thank you so much for sharing that. Jacqueline, can you please give a brief introduction and your role with the organization? Yeah, definitely. So I'm Jacqueline. I'm also interning at the Ocean River Institute this summer with Rob. Uh, And like Deba and Susanna said, I am working to uh, kind of play as a team captain of some some watersheds, some towns, and some organizations. And uh, my role is going to facilitate the organizations and towns in generating pledges um, and just really help foster a movement of uh, pledging not to spread, which is our ultimate goal. Thank you so much. Well, Rob, I appreciate the introduction to the interns and their roles at playing with the organization. I'm going to step back to you now. You know, the crux of our conversation is the why behind what you do. You kind of mentioned your love of the water as a child with Doodlebug, but it's been a long ride. Why? What keeps you going? What motivates you? Well, two motivations. One is the love of sailing. You know, it's uh, it's fun going, beating against the wind. You know, <laughs> I, uh, each one is an interesting challenge and how you how you find solutions, you know, where it's easy for people to do. So in the, in the lawn care, natural lawns for healthy soils campaign, here's a situation where by not spending money on lawn care, you're doing good. And the other part that, uh, that keeps you really going are the relationships. Uh, starting with the relationships of being able to have student interns. Uh, I, I meant to have them say where they went to school, but, you know, Susanna Buckley is at um, uh, Connecticut College and uh, Jackie Norris is at uh, Bridgewater State University and uh, Deba is up at UMass and Lowell. And so both UMass Lowell and um, Bridgewater State have uh, university teams uh, their work environmental action teams. And so it's really fun to get into some of that energy. And on the flip side, all the decision makers I'm working with, I have relationships with. So when I go to talk to senators and, and congressmen in Washington, I'll meet with the environmental legislative aid. And as a former science teacher, that's like a parent teacher conference where I'm learning the legislative style of the legislator from the aid. You know, what what are his concerns and also what are the constituencies uh, are, are into and stuff. And then I want the legislative aide to look good to his or her boss understanding. And so that's really, really where we do the shop talk. And then I can talk to the legislator on a more social level because the nuts and bolts will be done, you know, in conference when I'm not there and by staying on, on topic. So uh, years ago, uh, Scott Brown was our Republican Senator from Massachusetts. And I went down to the Senator and said, would you let the EPA regulate? And he goes, oh, no, we can't do that because the EPA caused the Gulf oil spill. And so I just said, okay, how's your family? And this enables me to come back six months later and say, Senator, would you support an ocean environmental trust fund that's very much like the Massachusetts Environmental Trust Fund that he knows that I know that he supported as a state senator? And again, he can't say yes or no. He has to check upstairs. But he can then pivot and say, Rob, I'm really proud of my daughter who works for the Animal Humane Society. So I'm known around Washington and I've become an access point for the big environmental groups like NRDC and EDF to have access to these people um, because they know where they're coming from. But um, uh, so but the relationships are very rewarding. And, you know, I've been doing this. I was in high school for Earth Day and these things take time. And it's very pleasing how far we've come. I never thought that I'd see, you know, so much wildlife that we have around us. You know, I live in the most densely settled urban area of the Northeast called Somerville uh, Municipality. And, uh, you know, we have a pair of Cooper's Hawks out there and, you know, bald eagles coming up the Merrimack River. It's just phenomenal. Uh, So it's it's very rewarding work. So speaking about how far you've come, what's the most valuable lesson that you would say you've learned about yourself on your journey? Uh, listen, listen, observe, and look for areas, you know, and also 
you know, you kind of break the problem down so that it's into manageable, so you can find bits that are doable and not get hung up on, on the big stuff. But, you know, I'm working on getting people to save the environment and they say, well, I don't know what to do. So I recommend they talk to a kid because they're closest to the ground and they see what's going on and stuff. I like that. Listen. And the other part sounds like systems thinking. It's very much systems thinking, and that's sort of where I got the name Ocean River, was from Rachel Carson in The Sea Around Us. At the end of the book, she talks about, you know, it's Oceanus, the ever-flowing ecosystems or something. And so it's, to me, it's not about defining where the world of the salmon or the otter ends and begins, but rather how everything all is interconnected together and how, yeah, so we just have to be thinking systemically uh, and, and holistically. Because if we deconstruct stuff, it isn't as simple as clockwork, you know. These are living systems. And so, you know, cells organize into organs and organs organize into bodies and bodies organize into populations and populations organize into communities and communities into ecosystems. And so there's this unfolding complexity of organization. And the more we're organized, the more of us there can be. And, and the more it's all interconnected, helping each other survive. So it, it's really exciting work. I like the idea of helping each other. You've been with Ocean River, if my math serves me correctly, 14 years or so. What are you most proud of? Um, Susanna, Jackie, and Deba. <laughs> what a great answer, Rob. What a great answer. <laughs> okay, so let's jump into the future. It's 2030. What does the future hold for Ocean River Institute? What kind of headlines would you like to see written about the organization? Yeah, more wildlife saved, cleaner environment, uh, you know, more carbon captured, uh, you know, each, each, right now it's, you know, can we pass the ocean-based climate solutions bill? And if you'd like to help us with that, please go to www.oceanriver.org. And when you go to that homepage there, you'll see there are six different campaigns there. Uh, and that's one of them. And pick whichever one. We'd love to have you help with any one. You're a hero. And the more, the better. You know, right now we're putting a lot into this uh, natural lawns for a healthy soils campaign. That's a real kind of sea change to get people to understand, to value lawns when they're natural and not shame people for having lawns. But in Massachusetts, we have over 2,000 square miles of lawns, of residential lawns. So if we could turn those into drawing carbon dioxide out of the air and increasing our water retention and restoring local water cycles, uh, that would be enormous. And then if other areas could follow suit, you know, and treat their lawns more naturally, because grass is just so amazing the way it can uh, build soil and capture carbon. And I will definitely put a link to the website in the show notes. My last question, and you kind of said something earlier about listening and relationship. So I'm going to take that as advice too, but this could be professional or personal. But if you could share some advice or words of wisdom with the audience, what would it be? Oh, well, that, that's been my mantra is that, you know, originally at Earth Day, we were saying, think globally, act locally. So I say, think locally, you know, act locally. And by acting locally, we make a global difference. So it's really important that you listen and, and think about it and, and keep it local. Well, I love the idea of keeping it local. I've also heard that the most important politics is local politics, too. Yeah, and this is why the, the people writing comments are so effective because the decision maker knows that that comment person, A, has thought about it and has friends, family, religious groups. There's a tip of an iceberg of different people. So, And our politicians never hear from their constituents except for the top three issues. And so they are so thrilled to get feedback from, to hear the ways to serve. Local. Well, Rob, Deba, Jacqueline, Susanna, thank you for your time today. And I look forward to catching up with you again soon. Well, thank you. It's been, an, it's been a pleasure to talk with you. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you like our show, please give us a rating and review on iTunes. And you can show your support by sharing our show with a friend or reach out to us on social media where you'll find us under our Nexus PMG handle. If there's a subject or topic you'd like to hear about, send me an email btu at nexuspmg.com or contact me via our website nexuspmg.com and while you're there you can sign up for our monthly newsletter where we share what we're reading and thinking about in the clean tech green tech sectors bigger than us is a nexus pmg production